Well, hi again, this is Bob, and we're getting ready to take a look at the introductory lesson to Chapter 2, and it's called Frequency Distributions in Graphs. So we're going to uh, learn a lot of basic things about organizing data and setting up class limits and class boundaries and so forth. Uh, it's pretty straightforward stuff. It's not really mathematically involved. And the idea of learning how to uh, organize our data and present it um, will be helpful in the latter part of chapter two because we're going to um, we're going to be drawing some special graphs. We're going to draw something a histogram, which is basically a bar graph, and we have something called an ogive, and we also have something called a cumulative frequency uh, diagram or distribution. So um, just We'll just work our way through it as best we can. I'd like to, uh, uh, I'll let everybody know that I'm on page 42, and about halfway down it says organizing data. <coughs> Excuse me. And what you see there is um, they tell us that we've got, I, I'm not going to do all this, but it'll be instructive to introduce a little bit of it. We've got the ages of the 50th, 50 uh, wealthiest people in the world. And that is basically raw data. It's not been organized into any um, uh, particular form. In other words, it's not from the youngest to the oldest uh, or uh, any meaningful way there. It's just raw data. And the first thing that they tell us, frequency, by the way, means how many times or how frequent. Uh, we're going to organize this in a second, but they tell us that a frequency distribution is the organization of raw data in a table form uh, using classes and frequencies. And by the way, shortly in another section, we're going to take our frequency, frequency distribution and turn it into a bar graph, or what our book calls a histogram. And they tell us that we can make these uh, uh, frequency distributions with either quantitative data or qualitative data. And you remember that qual quantitative would be uh, those data points that, uh, or the data classes uh, that we can um, uh, count, actually, or measure. And qualitative was usually something like male, female, uh, a person's religious preference, or uh, their uh, political preference, or as we're going to see in an example uh, in, uh, at the bottom of page 43, we have blood types, and those would be uh, qualitative. Anyway, just to get started a little bit, I'm not going to draw all of this. Uh, if you notice on the top of page 43, what they have done is they've organized those um, 50 wealthiest people there. Uh, 50 wealthiest men and women from the lowest age, from the youngest to the oldest, and then they've organized them somewhat in the table. And what we're basically looking for are like the uh, categories on the columns. So remember, this is just going to be an abbreviated um, uh, table here, but it starts off with class limits. Then we have like a tally, and then we have a frequency. And for example, now we're going to learn how to break these, establish these classes that are coming up right away here, but we'll go along with what they have for right now. Uh, 27 to 35. Then the next one is like 36 to 44. Okay, that's enough just to get the rough idea here. And of course, you could keep a tally by marks, like there's uh, one person, uh, male or female, age 27 to 35 of these 50, 50 wealthiest people in the world. And there were three people, there's my tally of three, uh, in the class of 36 to 44 years old. Anyway, so we just bring these over here. Here's one and here's three. And you can see how it's carried on down there in each one until we get our total of uh, 50. So that's, that introduces us the idea of class limits and tally and frequency. And we've still got a few things to add. And just keep in mind to where we're going to this, 
is actually um, coming up, making our uh, own frequency distribution, a group frequency distribution on top of that, and then uh, turning that into a bar graph uh, in a later section here. So let's take a look, and I will do this one here. Um, and, and again, I expect you to do a close reading of the entire chapter here. I'm only trying to hit the high parts or the places I feel that um, uh, some extra explanation might be helpful. But they tell us that um, in that same area there on page 43, that we've got two types of frequency distributions that are most often used, categorical frequency distribution and grouped frequency distribution. Now, there's another one that's called ungrouped that we're going to see when we have like a very small range, and we'll talk about that later, and, and you can take a look at one if you like on page 49. But let's start off by um, uh, following their example at the bottom of 43 there, example 2-1, uh, for a, a categorical frequency distribution. And it tells us that the data can be placed in um, uh, specific categories. And this is like nominal or ordinal level data. Remember that uh, blood types would basically be just nominal data. Okay? And so um, you can see the different, um, I'm going to try to reproduce this table. And it won't be as nice as this, but you can follow along. Here we've got our class, and we've got our tally. There's one new thing here that I wanted to cover. Then we have our frequency. And then finally, we uh, have our percent. I'm going to ask you to bear with me um, on um, my uh, handwriting in terms of the uh, e-lives until we get into chapter three. Uh, chapter 1 and 2 really don't lend themselves to solving a lot of problems, but it'll be much more like a blackboard for me when we get into chapter 3, and we're going to turn much more mathematical uh, than just trying to reproduce or see where they come up with some numbers here. But anyway, we can put the classes in, and the classes are blood types, and we have A, B, O, and A, B. And then you can go to uh, the next page, if you're following along with this, and notice that they tell us the steps. And then we're going to put our tallies in there. In other words, for A, there were five. So I can put a frequency there. And for B, there were seven. Uh, I think I've only given you around one question to do uh, on two one. And I will ask you to do like one frequency distribution. So uh, normally you can punch this into a calculator or a computer program. Uh, but I feel it's worth our, our time to uh, learn how to do this uh, just because it's interesting and useful. And then for the O, we had nine. And for the last one, AB, we had four. Okay, and it's important to note that our total was uh, 50, or excuse me, 25. And this percent thing should seem really straightforward here. Uh, in order for us to find the percent that are in each class of these uh, nominative, uh, this nominative data, we would just take, for example, in class A, we would just take 5 over 25 and that equals 0 0.20. And then if we multiply that by 100, we get 20%. By the way, they give a formula up on top there. They tell us that percent, I'm showing this up here, equals frequency over n. And by the way, notice, that's, <coughs> notice that that's a, a small n, not a capital N, because we're only dealing with a sample here. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so and then times 100 to turn it into a percent. So uh, for 7, we'd have like 7 over 25 times 100 
and they tell us that that's 28%. 9 out of 25, they tell us that that would be 0.36, and when we take that times 100, we get 36%. And then the last one would be like 4 over 25 times 100. We'll just take the book's word there, that's 16%. But of course, the percents add up to 100%, and so all of our data is accounted for. Okay, well, we're going to get a little more serious uh, with the next question, and that's grouped frequency distribution. And that's at the bottom of 44. And this will be a lot, uh, uh, very close to the problem that you're going to be doing in, uh, for your homework in this section here. And this, they tell us uh, we've got a large range, and the range is uh, the difference between the smallest and the largest data value. And they tell us that this represents, um, it really doesn't matter what it represents, but it's always nice to know what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a distribution of blood glucose levels in milligrams per deciliter. And you can imagine that this, these, um, um, these values are given us to us in the ones place. So there was most likely some rounding off uh, in the tenths place. But we're going to have to concern ourselves with that right now. And what I want to do is just get a little bit of this graph going on the bottom of page 44, and then I can refer to it or ask you to refer to it as we go through these important items on page 45. And much of this we know already from chapter 1. Okay, I'm only going to do the first couple of these here, but uh, by the way, notice that they didn't give us the raw data. They've been nice enough to put it in the table for us, and they tell us that our first class uh, involving this blood glucose measurements is 58 to 64. Now, what we are going to need here are the class boundaries. Uh, we know that these uh, values are given this to us in the ones place, uh, but there's another reason for this, and that's because at a later point we're going to draw a graph or a histogram, bar graph of this, and we want to make sure there are no gaps or it's continuous. So what we're going to do is we're going to get the class boundaries, and remember how we did that. What we're going to do for 58 is we're going to subtract 0.5 from the lower limit. That's uh, remember, what we're trying to do now is go from class limits to class boundaries. So what we do is we take the 58, or call it 58.0 if you like, and we're going to subtract 0.5 from it. And that gives us 57.5. And that's the lower class boundary. Now, the way we get our upper class boundary is to add 0.5 to 64. Remember, this would be like 64.0. We saw that stuff in chapter 1. So we add 0.5, and that gives us 64.5. OK? Well, let's do one more here. I'm not going to be too concerned about the tally and the frequency because we're mostly interested with finding, <coughs> um, excuse me again, class limits and class boundaries. Okay, so the next class uh, set of class limits was 65 to 71. Okay, well, we can immediately see that when we subtract 60, uh, when we take 0.5 away from 65, we're already there. In other words, we've already got the next class boundary. Uh, it's 64.5. Whether you just bring this 64.5 down or whether you subtract 0.5 from 65, Sixty-four point five is our uh, lower boundary in the next class, 
And then we're going to add 0.5 to 71, and that gives us 71.5. Okay, let's do one more of these here. In the next class is 72 to 78. So we have already got our lower boundary uh, in that class of 72 to 78. It's 71.5. You can just bring the 71.5 uh, down, or you can subtract 0.5 from uh, 72. Okay, and then we're going to add 0.5 to 78, and that gives us 78.5. Okay, well, what we've learned already is how we find the, uh, how we go from class limits to class boundaries. And you may be asking yourselves, well, where do we come up with the class limits? Because it's pretty straightforward finding the class boundaries once we have the class limits. Uh, but to find the class limits, they're going to uh, instruct us to do that, or how to do that, in the uh, next example. So this example is going to help us uh, find some important things with regard to the um, uh, class limits and class boundaries. Okay. So remember, this would be the lower class limit in this class, 58. This would be the upper class limit, 64. And when we go to class boundaries, the lower class boundary is 57.5, and the upper class boundary is 64.5. Okay, I'm not going to worry about the tally or the frequency. Well, let's go to the uh, next basic thing here. Uh, they tell us that, uh, uh, well, they tell us a couple of things. They tell us that the, um, uh, there's a rule of thumb and that the class limits should have the same decimal place as the data. Okay, we've got that taken care of. We, we know that we're reporting the data to one. And, but here's why we have that point five there. But the class boundary should have one additional place value and it should end in a five. Okay, so again, if our uh, information or our data values are given us to the ones place, then the next place beyond the ones place is the uh, uh, tenths place, and all of our class boundaries are given to the tenths place, and they end in five. Okay, well, you can see what they did on finding the lower and upper limit um, on, on, on page 45 now, just going through this. And now we're going to uh, go down and take a look at the uh, class width. Okay, so uh, I'm going to get a uh, new page and just do a little bit example of the first two there was class width. So I need my little, just the first parts of my diagram here. So we had our class limits, we had our class boundary, and our first class limit was 58 to 64, and our first class boundary was 57.5 to 64.5, and I'll do one more here, and that should be enough. Next one was 65 to 71. So this gave us 64.5 to 71.5. Okay, this is all we need to find class width. Now, uh, they tell us, and again, I'm going to, this definite, there are actually three or four ways you can find the class uh, width. Remember, that's what we're looking for now is class width. And, uh, and it gets wordy when you start throwing in the, you know, the upper boundary and the lower boundary or the upper class limit or lower class limit. So I'm going to show a couple of simple ways and you will, I'm sure, discover that there's more than uh, two ways to do this. But they tell us that uh, the class width is found by subtracting the lower or upper class limit of one class from the lower or upper class limit of the other, of the next class. Okay, let's sort that out here. What that means is the class width is not 64 take away 58, okay? 
it's 65 take away 58. And that equals 7. Okay? Now you could say, well, wait a minute, why don't I take 71 and subtract 64? That gives me 7 also. And that's true. You could also do that. Okay, now you can also find the class width from the class boundaries. In other words, and you, our class width is going to be 7, and there are several different ways we can find that out. Remember, as I said before, these are just pretty basic math uh, calculations, subtraction in this case, but we have to, we've got some new terms here that we need to deal with. So another way to find the class, uh, to find the uh, class width would be to take 64.5 and subtract 57.5, and that also equals 7. Or you could take 71.5 and subtract 64.5. That would give you 7. Okay, or you could take 71.5 and subtract 64.5. That would give you 7 also. Okay, so I've shown you several ways to find out that the class width is 7. Probably the simplest way is just go to the class uh, limits, and here you see 58, here you see 65, and you go 65 minus 58 is uh, 7. If we peek down one more here, notice that the next one in the class goes from 72 uh, to 78. Well, 72 take away 65, of course, is 7. So it shouldn't be too hard for us to find the class width. And they tell us several different ways to get it. Okay, and again, I apologize for this being kind of a word in your section here. Uh, I'm sure most of you, or many of you, can. Uh, pick this up from the reading. And the one thing I like best about our book is it really does a good job of showing things by example. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read through and give some examples referring again to the bottom of page 44 so I don't have to keep drawing that graph each time. Uh, they're going to tell us some things and there will be some homework questions on this. Here are some general rules they tell us that researchers uh, uh, follow or consider when they uh, construct a frequency distribution um, uh, diagram or graph or table. And the first one is there should be between 5 and 20 classes. Okay? Now, they tell us that that's not a hard and fast rule, but for our purposes, five, between 5 and 20 classes is great. And if you notice, on our example at the bottom of page 44, we've got seven classes. Okay, so we're certainly between 5 and 20. Now, you could have fewer classes, or you could have more classes than 20. You could have fewer than uh, 5 and more than 20, but that's going to make the data uh, table either extremely small and tight or extremely large and spread out. So they've decided that between 5 and 20 works best. Okay, now the next thing, this is really important for our purposes because we are just going, you're going to be sketching one uh, group frequency distribution or histogram uh, from your group frequency distribution. And we want to know, uh, it's, they tell us it's preferable, and in our, place, in our particular class, uh, it's necessary. But they tell us that it's not absolutely necessary in the real world uh, to have the um, uh, class width be an odd number. Notice, recall that our class width in this example was 7, which is an odd number. Okay? And it's good to have an odd number because when, and remember, you're, when we go to graph this, um, having an odd number for the class width turns out that when we find the midpoint of that class, it will be to the ones place also. If you have an odd number, in other words, there won't be a remainder. We have an odd number in 7, 
And when we find the midpoint of the uh, class, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when we find the midpoint of that class, uh, having it an odd number means that we won't end up with a decimal, which would be very difficult to find if we're sketching the graph. So here's how we find the midpoint, by the way. There's a, of course, there's a couple of ways to find the midpoint. They tell us that we take the lower boundary and the upper boundary, and we just average them or divide by 2. Or they tell us also that the midpoint, x in, we can take the lower limit, the lower class limit, of course, and the upper limit, and divide by 2. So if we're going, and again, you can read this, and um, you know, I could probably skip over a lot of this, and uh, but I think it's important for us in case there's something that you missed in the reading that this will help. So if we're going to find the midpoint uh, using the uh, uh, lower limit and upper limit of the classes, notice that our first class was 58, and our second class, excuse me, the, the lower limit the uh, uh, of our class 58 to 64, the 58 was the lower value and the 64 was the higher value. And when we add those together and divide by 2, we get 61. Okay? And notice that since we had an odd class width, 7 is an odd number, that we end up with a, uh, we don't end up with like 61 point something, we end up with a value that's to the tenths, to the uh, ones place, exactly like our data value. So that would be very easy to find on a graph. Okay, then they also tell us that we can find it by averaging the class limits. And our class limits were 57.5. Then our next one was 64.5. And if we add those up and divide by 2, we also get 61. So we have a couple of ways to find the class widths. And at the very bottom of page 45, and this is what I was trying to emphasize, uh, maybe a little too far ahead, but it tells us the midpoint is the numeric location of the center of the class. We just determined for that first class at 61. And midpoints are necessary for graphing when we get to section uh, 2, 2. And it tells us if the class width is the even number, uh, then the midpoint is in tenths. In other words, let's go to uh, one more uh, example here. Look at what they've got on the top of uh, page 46. They say, for example, let's say that we had a class width of 6. This is just an example. And then that means, and then the uh, uh, boundaries would be 5. Uh, 5.5 to 11.5. So let's say that we had a class boundaries from 5.5 to 11.5, and when we added those together and divided by 2, and by the way, recall here that the class width is 6. We don't really know all the values, but we know that the class uh, width is an even number. So notice that when we average the lower and the upper we, and divide by 2, we end up with 8.5. Now, on graph paper, you can only estimate 0.5. Either that or you have to get, to get much finer graph paper. So, but in, on normal graph paper, you could easily find uh, a number to the ones place, but not to the tenths place, etc. Well, the rest of this is pretty straightforward. They tell us that the classes must be mutually exclusive. In other words, we can't have one class go from 20 to uh, 10 to 20, and the next class go from 20 to 30. Okay, we can see why, because we don't know which class uh, where, for example, 20 would go to. And notice that the next one goes from like 30 to 40. 
Well, if we had an age of 20, would it go in this class or this class? So the, that's what they say when the, the, that's what they mean when they say the classes must be mutually exclusive. Okay? Um, I used a different example than they did, but that's the same idea. So what they would do is go from maybe like 10 to 20, and then go from 21 to 31, and then 32 to 42, and then 43 to 53. Okay, so this doesn't work, but this would work fine. That was their other example. Okay, and then the rest of it, uh, fortunately, is from the reading that I believe you can grasp this. The classes must be continuous, okay? And what they mean by that is uh, even if there are no values in the class, the class must be included in the frequency distribution. In other words, there should be no gaps in the distribution. And the only exception would be when the, the class has a zero frequency in the first or the last class. Okay, so if the uh, original, the first class had a frequency of zero, then we wouldn't need to include it uh, in our uh, uh, frequency distribution. Or if our last class did not have any members, we could omit that. Okay, then number five tells us the classes must be exhaustive. Okay, in other words, you need a class for all data. And then number six, they tell us that the classes must be equal in width. Okay, and, and that should make sense from what we've seen earlier there. Okay, well, here's what's going to happen. This is the last uh, example I'm going to speak to here. And this will be exactly like the question that you're going to have in the homework on section 2.1. They are going to ask us to draw a group frequency distribution um, for some record high temperatures in each of the 50 states. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw a couple of these uh, classes here. And then I will ask you to refer to the overall diagram on page 48. So, um, you can see on the middle of page 47, we have the uh, uh, example 2.2. Two. We have the record temperatures for each of the 50 states. And this is going to walk us through, step by step, how we do our, um, uh, our distribution. In this case, there will be a group frequency distribution. And there's a procedure table up on the top of page 47. And I am going to talk uh, through each of these uh, points, uh, each step, to make sure. Because in the past, we may have asked ourselves, well, I don't know where to start the classes off. I don't know how many classes there should be. Uh, and I don't understand. Um, uh, how to get some of the values or get going on the classes and their numbers. And this example will tell us everything. So uh, what I want to do, though, before that is just get the first couple of classes. So if you can bear with me here. Okay, and I'm not going to bother with the tally because you can see that yourself there. But um, I need to just get this much on here, 104 to 109, uh, excuse me, 100. And then, of course, the boundary would be 99.5 to 104.5. And our first frequency was 2. And then we'll do one more. The next one would be 105 to 109. I'm using your values here, but we're going to learn how to get them. And this would be 104.5 to 109.5. And that had a frequency of 8. 
Okay, that's all we need to get going. Okay, so uh, back on 47 there, um, they have already uh, taken those values, those 50 values, and the first thing that they did is they found the range, this will be important for chapter 3, and that's just the highest value, subtract the lowest value. Okay, so we know our highest value was 134, and our lowest value was 100. So our range equals 34. Now, here's the nice thing about our book. The book will tell us, although it's not that hard to uh, play around and come up with an odd number for classes, but the book tells us that in this particular case, and they will do this in the homework, that they have chosen seven classes. Okay, so we're going to have, in other words, down to here will be a total of seven classes. So once we know that we're going to be using seven classes, we take the range, which was 34, and divide it by seven, and that gives us 4.9. This is our class width, by the way. In other words, we want to know how wide these classes are going to be. And it turns out that when we divide 34 by 7, we get 4.9. And then they tell us that we always round up. Not off, but up. So our class width is going to be 5. Now, notice that 5 is an odd number. Now, just arbitrarily, let me show you. Let's say that we had still had a range of 34, and we thought, well, let's try six classes. Well, that would have turned out to be 5.7, and that would have rounded up to 6. Uh, we would have had a hard time uh, finding, a, when we went to find the midpoint of our classes, having an even class width, that would have given us a problem. Okay, so that's why we didn't use um, six classes, and that's why we're going to go with seven classes. Okay, well, the next thing it tells us to do is how do we get started here uh, on this uh, table? Okay, and the first thing that they tell us to do, and this is on the top of uh, page 48, is they say select a starting point for the lowest class limit. They tell us it can be the smallest data value or any convenient number less than the smallest data value. Okay, well, we're just going to start with the smallest data value, which was 100. Okay? And that was the lowest, or kind of wordy to say it, but that was the lowest of the temperatures uh, that they gave us there. Remember, the high was uh, 134. Okay, so then the next thing it tells us to do on that um, now that we've got uh, now we've got our lowest value and we chose it to be seven and we've uh, got seven classes which should fit just right. Uh, the next thing that they tell us to do uh, would be to go down and add five. And by the way, there's more than one way to do this, but what we do is we take and uh, add five all the way down the lower class uh, limits. This is where it gets wordy, but in, so 105, 110, 115, 120, 125, and then 130. Now, those are our lower class limits, and it tells us to get our um, upper class limits, and you can see it right at the, uh, at the beginning or sort of the top of page 48 there. It tells us to take one away from the uh, second class there, the, the lower limit of that second class. In other words, it's 105, take away one is 104. And this is not the only way to do that, but they've actually changed something in this edition of the text. But in other words, 
it, that should make sense to us anyway. If this value is 105, then and we're to the ones place here, then certainly the uh, the, the upper class limit of that first class should be uh, 104. Anyway, so then now what they tell us to do is add 5 all the way down there in this particular way of explaining it. Well, let's see what we've got. We've got 7 classes. 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And we've got just enough um, space, if you will, uh, for our, uh, in other words, our first class starts at 100. That's our lowest value. Our highest value is 134, and that will fit nicely there. We could have gone with a different number of classes, but that would either make our graph be really small and tight or really big and spread out. Okay, well, let's quickly get the class limits, and that's just subtract. I won't do all of these, but it'd be like 99.5 to 104.5, and then 104.5 to 109.5. We'll do one more, 109.5 to 114.5. Okay, so if you've got the following here. If you understand how we find the range and how they told us to have seven classes and how we divided seven into 34, which was our range, and we ended up with 4.9 and we rounded up to five, which indeed is going to be our class width. And ideally, it's an odd number, so we're good there. Uh, and we'd also recall from earlier example that we can pretty straightforward, in a straightforward manner, find out what the uh, class, uh, we've got the class, the individual classes, and then our class boundaries. And I do appreciate you following along or hanging in there until we get to chapter three, uh, and I can start doing something that's not in a table form. Anyway, I think you can see, for example, that there were two values between 100 and 104, two states with two temperatures, if you will, and then eight in the next one, and um, so the next one was 18. Okay, and as I said, I dispensed with the tally there, but you can see how we come down at the very end and end up with a total of all 50 states and their temperatures being represented there. What's really important here is to uh, learn how to get the class limits and then get the class boundaries. And the question that I'm going to give you for homework will be an odd question, and so you can check your answer all the way along with it. And I may have mentioned before that um, uh, usually this uh, you can have a, a frequency distribution done by entering the numbers into a calculator that has the correct uh, program in it or just entering it into a computer that's got the software and uh, hit a button and it will calculate um, the number of classes and, and give a really nice uh, spreadsheet or uh, printout of all the information that we're going to be giving longhand here. Okay, well we've got one final thing to cover in this section. And this will come back uh, very important in a later section. And that is the cumulative um, frequency distribution. So I'm going to ask you to refer, for this last uh, bit here, I'm going to ask you to refer to the middle of page 48, where we have uh, that, what we just did with the class limits and the class boundaries and the frequencies. And I'm going to go up to the top of page 49, and I'm going to uh, use this symbol for less than. And this is how we do a cumulative frequency uh, distribution. So we had some values. I'm using the class boundaries now, starting off less than 99.5. And the next one was 104.5. And the next one was 109.5, and 
and less than 119.5. And the last one was less than 134.5. Now, this is going to be like frequency, but it's called cumulative frequency, accumulated or added up as we go, if you will. Okay, and we will be doing, if, uh, it turns out that cumulative frequency uh, distributions are really important uh, when we're doing things like norming tests, uh, they're going to lead us to percentiles when we get into chapter three. And we'll actually be doing our own percentile graph uh, using cumulative frequencies. But anyway, th this should be straightforward. We're just going to keep a running total of the values that we have. And the nice thing is that uh, what I'm going to do is the same thing that we're doing uh, on um, and they walk us through it on page 49, and it all comes from the uh, table uh, in the middle, it's sort of a little lower than the middle on page 48. So how many values did, how many, remember these all represent temperatures, degrees Fahrenheit. There were, um, um, there were no values that were less than 99.5, okay? Now, how many values were less than 104.5? Remember, here's where we're at so far. No, there was no state uh, that was tallied that had a temperature lower than 99.5. Now, the next class up, we're using class boundaries here, how many states had a temperature lower than 104.5? And that would be two. So, zero and two was still two. Now, between 104, uh, greater than 104.5, but less than 109.5, there were eight states. And when I add those eight states to two, I get 10 states whose temperatures are representative. So what I'm doing is I'm taking uh, the two and I'm the, in the first class there, if you like, and the eight in the next class, and I'm adding them together for a running tally. Now, the next thing we'd ask ourselves is how many entries were there, frequencies, uh, that were less than our next class of 114.5? Well, we had um, 18 between 109.5 and 114.5, and we had 8 that were between 104.5 and 109.5, and we had two that were between 99.5 and 104.5. So when we add those three values up, our next entry will be uh, 28. So I think you can see what's happening here if you're referring back to that diagram on page 48. We're keeping a running total rather than an individual total here. Okay, well, there were 13 uh, in the next group there, and that was in the group of 114.5 to 119.5. So when we add that 13 to 28, we get 41. And in the next group, there were seven. And when we add that seven to 41, we get 48. And the last two groups there had one and one respectively. So one and 48 is 49 and 1 and 49 is 50, and that 50 turns out to be agreed with our total. So what we did before was we added each of the individual classes frequency up and we got 50, but this time what we're doing is we're keeping a running total of, our, of the uh, count for each individual um, class there. 0, 2, 10, 28, 14, um, excuse me, uh, 28, 41, 48, 49, and 50. And of course, you could go backwards. If you wanted to know, you could go 10 subtract 2 and get 8 um, and find out what, if you wanted to go backwards and find out the number in a specific class. Okay, well, that should give us a really good um, background
in finding the uh, in, in getting us familiar with some new terms and then the basics laid down for doing a group frequency distribution. Uh, I will be back shortly when we look at section 2.2 and we're going to take the information that we learned in 2.1 and actually draw some graphs. We're going to draw a histogram, frequency polygon, and an OJI. Thank you.